All right. Well, welcome to the podcast. My name is Eddie Molina. I am the Southeast Regional Manager for the Alert Program. I've been with these guys brand new as a, as a full-time guy. I retired after 25 years at the San Antonio Police Department and had a great career, had a lot of experience, uh, great experiences, stuff, you know, got, got the chance to work with people that are probably not worthy of being around. And the same thing happened for me in the training environment. And that's kind of what we're doing here this week is we're at the Texas Tactical Police Officers Association Conference in Dallas, Texas. TTPOA has played a big part in teaching me a lot of what I have learned along the way. And that's kind of how I came to be friends with you guys. Actually, we got to train with you, Tony, a long time ago. And Tim, I think we've known each other for about 20 years, you know, through the, through the SWAT circles. Um, let's, go, let's go ahead and let you guys introduce yourself. Tony, tell us a little bit about your background and how you came into this uh, circle. So, you know, been involved in martial arts, defensive tactics, combatives for 40 years now, but started off like as a martial artist, right? In the, uh, in the 80s, I know you know when the 80s are, Tim probably knows the 80s, Casey, I don't know if you know when the 80s are. I'm a lot older than I look and like, you look today's my then, birthday, man. so oh, thank wow. you very much. Happy birthday, how old are you? 44. Wow. Okay. Well, you're a baby, but you remember the 80s. <laughs> the... Um, uh, and it, it really all started with my, my high gear suit, where I was trying to um, find a manufacturer and I contacted the people that make Redman. And because I didn't want to be a manufacturer and I'd spent like five years prototyping the gear. And they said, look, you know, you need to talk to Gary Klugowitz. I don't know if you guys remember Gary, yeah. Gary Klugowitz. Of course, he was the, uh, the chairman of ASLED at the time, American Society of Law sure. Enforcement Trainers. So I lived in Canada and, uh, uh, I drove to Toronto where he was teaching at a high liability conference. And we talked literally after the show for five hours. And what I was explaining really wasn't just so much about the gear. It was about the methodology of startle flinch, of surprise, of how do you really evaluate the psycho uh, psychophysical response time of an officer if the role player can't move properly. And uh, he said to me after the fact, he said, uh, it was 1993, he said, I don't know if, if it was the Macho company that made Redman. He said, I don't know if Macho will be into this completely different design. He says, but I am fascinated with, <laughs> with your system. He said, would you come and talk at Aslet? And I said, I don't know what that is. He said, it was a law enforcement training, not, you know, worldwide. And uh, I said, okay. And he invited me. It was Dallas, 1993. And he, in the the event was already booked, but he, he was the chairman and he jammed me in there. And literally like that was the year I closed my school because I just had people coming. A lot of people, a lot of people were like this. Her? Who is this guy? He's not a cop. He's from Canada. He's never arrested anybody. So I had a lot of, a lot of people that didn't like my messages and uh, a lot of people that went, wow, you know, we need to talk more. And that, that really is how I got into law enforcement. Uh, shout out to Gary Klugu, it's selfless. He would always say, we're still friends to this day. And he'd say, I don't agree with everything you teach, but it's provocative enough that I need to expose you to the law enforcement community because I believe it'll make people safer. Yeah, and, and it's an awesome system. The spear system came, it, when you brought the spear system out to all of us, it was just one of those things that was, it was cutting edge stuff, stuff that we needed to get better at. Uh, Tim, how about you, man? Tell me a little bit about your background. Well, he was, uh, Tony was pointing out the year 1993, that's when I started my career in law enforcement. Awesome. So, uh, but, you know, spent the 11 years on Abilene SWAT, but I've been teaching uh, de defensive tactics with Abilene PD at their academy since 2001, firearms since 2004, and then finally got a, a spot on the SWAT team with Abilene in 2004. So just by default, I've kind of been uh, in in the middle of all of this training uh, on and on. And let's be honest, once I, once I uh, met Coach Blauer, you know, he's been teaching rapid response and crisis intervention for many, many years before that even. So uh, just just been a huge part of, of developing how I um, – have been trained and now even train others. Awesome. Awesome. You know, I, and I know I'm going to have to pull this out of y'all um, along the way because y'all are you know, fairly, fairly humble uh, in the stuff that we've done along the way. And I appreciate that. So, Tony, what was your sport of choice growing up? Uh, I'm from Canada. So you're either a skier or a skater. Awesome. You're playing hockey or skiing. And, I, and my, my, both my parents were high level uh, ski patrol. And um, uh, so I was a skier. I grew up on skis uh, 
I think I was on skis like three years old skiing by myself. No crazy. kidding. Yeah. Uh, and, and there was, there was a point where like, that was what I did all the time. And, you know, people would talk, okay, you know, how far are you going to take this? You're going to try and go to the Olympics. You're going to do, and it was interesting because it's, it's one of the things that I think the most important part of my journey is the discovery and, and the, the distinction between the psychology of fear and the biology of fear, because I was a competitive athlete and you know, I was, I was wrestling, gymnastics, uh, baseball, all, like all the, everything, but skiing was my main thing, but I never, I never podiumed. I never, I was, I was my worst, worst enemy, like many of us are in different right. parts of our lives. And, uh, even to this day, there's not a lot of, you know, what I, what I, what I consider self-coaching information to help us coach ourselves through issues with fear, psychology, performance. And, and so I would ski my ass off and, but I'd always wipe out. I'd always, you know, ski off the course. So I didn't, you know, in psychobabble terms, people go, oh, self-sabotage. But it wasn't that. To me, self-sabotage is you didn't show up. Right. I showed up. I was in shape. I wanted to win. But I was so scared of letting down my team, letting down my family. Am I really this good? People say you're this good. And and again, you know, I I, I tease and joke about, when people go, well, that's self-sabotage. That's imposter syndrome. I go, like it, no. Like we're giving, like everything is a label these days. So you can have a phobia and a condition. It's, it's, it, it has to do with how we talk to ourselves and how we're coached. And I really believe if we started to, and, and, and Tim will, Tim will know this as, as, as my program has expanded, as much as we do, that's about the physiology and, and the physical, the most important stuff is understanding uh, adaptive courage and resiliency and the whole mindset piece. That's a, and that's a huge topic right now, the resiliency and the, and the mental health of everything. And I definitely want to come back to that in a little bit, but Tim, what was your sport of choice growing up and how did you, how did you move into the defensive tactics world? Uh, my sport was baseball. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I wish I had the stats to prove it, but, um, because my mom taught me visualization skills because I practiced hitting a golf ball, um, that baseball coming at me, looked huge and I was a leadoff batter and uh didn't strike out for six years straight which is probably unheard of so I wish I like I said I wish I had the stats to prove that but uh it did me well until uh me and all my buddies were about 16 years old and since I didn't eat my veggies and protein I didn't grow to be a full-size person but all my other friends were continuing <laughs> to grow and I couldn't keep up physically with those guys um on the field so to speak but uh you know it's interesting how later on once again, being introduced to, to Tony Blower's uh, methodologies, how the sports psychology came into play. And I finally kind of figured out a blueprint for what had been happening mm. even way back when I was a kid playing baseball. That's awesome. So what's your – what form do you guys teach? I know you're, you're doing a lot of training for Abilene. What forms do you stick to when you all are, are def, uh, I guess, teaching defensive tactics – is there something you follow specifically, a plan you follow specifically, or have you molded one for your specific department? Yeah, we really have kind of specialized. With Abilene, we we're very blessed to have our own academy, so we kind of specialize to, to what we want our, our cadets and our officers to know. So we mold it, and we kind of take a hodgepodge of, of this and that. Um, you know, one of my fellow uh, um, SWAT team members, Phil Sage, was – uh, steeped in the martial arts, and uh, I've taught here at the SWAT conference with him before. Before I ever uh, taught with with Coach Blower, and uh, that had a lot of influence since he was in the training division for a long time at Abilene. But really, just um, you try to you try to find and pick the best, and then as long as the administration backs it, um, you know you move forward. And, yeah, it works. and so now finally, <laughs> it's it's interesting. But now finally, this year we're beginning to introduce more spear into our academy training for our cadets. Wow, that is awesome. And, and that's a long road. And it's, it's hard. It's one of those things where we have to stick to the long road. And Phil, man, I, 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 you know, I, I love that guy. I heard he retired recently. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Good for him. He's moving on to, to better things. And that's good. So the, the psychology of everything. And, and that's one of the things that we don't talk about. Everybody knows that Tony Blower teaches Spear. And I think you kicked everybody's butt at one point at, you know, on all of these conferences, threw us around and speared us all. I interrupt. I just, I just, uh, <clears throat> Uh, bumped into a gentleman who's probably 250 pounds, 260, 
and uh, out of Fort Bragg, just retired, and uh, you know says, "Hey man, how are you?" And, 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 I, and I know I know him, but I don't know where. Like uh, I was on nine, I was on Bragg on nine eleven training at at range 19 if no people kidding. know what that yeah. is so like that's how far back and i was there before that and so there's so many people that that and this guy says to me and he's huge and i'm like i'm turning 61 in may and he's huge and like he, my hand still hurts from when we shook hands and i get up every morning and going did i have that that was weird did that feel that way that yesterday and uh he says to me he says hey hit me up next time you're down in southern pines he says i'll let you kick my ass again again and i'm thinking when did I ever kick this guy's ass? Yeah. Like, like he was, he was freaking huge. So I, it just made me think of that, that when you made that joke that I've, I don't remember kicking all your asses, but maybe I did when I was younger. Yeah. And you know what? That's part of the job. I think, I think that's why we keep bringing you back to these things is you've had an impact along the way. So we all, knew, we all know that you teach the physical part of the stuff, right? But nobody talks about the, the mental, the mental part that you always preach. And you've preached that forever. Forever. Always part of the program. Hit us with a little bit of that. So it's an interesting thing because in the a type A community, which like, you know, every, everyone here is, right? And, and uh, we like things the way we like things. We're very, we've all got an unconscious bias and our unconscious bias is our blind spot. And part of that is, and I remember actually, it was a private course I did with Sandy Wall uh, back in the day with, with uh, you know, his SWAT team at the time. And I said to them, and I would always bring this type of, it's almost touchy-feely, metaphysical, okay, we're going to meditate and, and, and I'm handing out crystals and stuff and I'm making fun, but I'm not making fun. But I, I started off the class, I said, if your point guy was having problems at home, would you want him to let you know before a call? And the immediate reaction was, no, keep that shit at home, man. Stay focused on the job. And I was like, he just found out his wife wants to leave him. His, his daughter's doing drugs. His son's, you know, a jerk. And, and do you want his head muddied by that moving in? And they kind of look. So the first, the first type A answer was, no, keep your shit together. and yeah. fo And then it was like, no, but we don't give each other permission to communicate. And uh, I looked at them, I said, I want you guys to think about that. Does anyone have any questions? And uh, they said, no. I said, okay, let's, let's, let's take a quick break. So I go over and this is all deliberate. We take the break and three guys walk up to me and they go, hey, Coach Blower, I got a question. I go, I just asked if there's any questions. Go ahead and want to ask in front of the group. So I stopped the group. I go, three people have questions here. I just asked you if you had questions. You guys will fast rope, jump out of an airplane maybe, low crawl, run towards gunfire, but you're afraid of public speaking. Every one of us has a fear. Yeah. And if I'm afraid to be vulnerable so that if I'm here and I go, like last night, this is true. Last night I had a meeting uh, at midnight and I flew in went to sleep, set an alarm for 11 o'clock, got up, tested all my equipment earlier, had a meeting with a, a, a country overseas, different time zone, very important meeting, but I was so wired from that, I couldn't sleep. So I'm like, I'm on three, four hours, very interrupted sleep. And uh, so, so much so that I actually just forgot what I was gonna, uh, the story I was gonna tell you. The, um, oh, the, the, the this, this mindset piece, right? And the whole, so going back to the story with, with, uh, with Sandy and the guys is I, I tell people that we are, we are uh, very focused on the physical, very fo focused on the protective. And I stand by a sec. There's Sandy right there. I was just talking about you. Can, sir, can you, can you keep it down, please? Uh, totally distracted and lost my train of thought here, but, uh, was, Sandy does that to a lot of people. Sandy that was weird. He, he, he snuck in like a, like a, like a ninja. Uh, that was the loudest ninja I've ever heard. Right. Yes. <laughs> right. Very loud ninja. And, uh, the, I forget why I was bringing up the thing with, with last, with last night and what happened. 
uh, and it was connected. It was going to be such a good connection, and I kind of blew it in a lot of distractions. I apologize to the listeners who are going, is this guy been drinking before the show? Because I totally, totally lost my train of thought. Hey, so you were talking about the guys that didn't didn't want to ask questions in front of their buddies, and you were talking to the group about that stuff, and, and that's very important because that, that's, like that's like the national standard there. Nobody does that. Well, well, what I was trying to get the guys to do when I stopped them, I said, hey, there's like the three of you had questions. You're okay with running towards the gunfire but you're maybe not okay with saying i'm sorry or i love you or something that we consider touchy-feely in this whole oh vulnerability is a weakness and uh oh i just remember the connection so i'm exhausted right now i said to tim earlier make sure that i take a nap today because i'm going to be a zombie tonight and i want to i want to go hear the talk and i want to be at the dinner and uh the it's this idea of not being afraid to say to somebody so that, you know, if Tim and I were about to get in a fight with two guys, I want to be able to look at him and go, dude, I'm, I'm kind of freaking out right now. What's going on? Like, Hey, okay, we're going to do like, if you communicate where you're at, you can be coached. You can be inspired by somebody. One of the things I tell people is that, and this is such a heavy concept, Courage is contagious, but you can't be brave if you're not afraid. You yeah. can't be brave if you're not afraid. So, you know, I've, you know, I've trained so many tier one guys over the years and there's half of them are like, I got no fear. <clears throat> and then half of them are like, yeah, fuck, I'm scared. Am I allowed to swear in this show? We were trying to stay away from it. Okay. We'll, just, we'll edit that I just one realized out. We just, yeah. We'll edit, we'll edit that one out. I've been doing pretty good because a lot of my shows, it would sound like this. Beep, 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 yeah. beep, beep. Hello, beep, beep. <laughs> um, and, and I remember actually uh, uh, one trip to Bragg where I met a couple of guys from this, this group I was training off-site coffee shop. After our meeting, one of the guys says, hey, do you want to go jump? I'm going jumping later. And I know he means skydiving, right? I'm afraid of heights. So I go like this on the table. I go like jump, like up and down. He goes, ha, ha, ha. He goes, out of an airplane. I said, I'm good. He goes, aren't you Mr. Fear Management? Does the air quotes. And I said, yeah, man, I'm managing my fear by not jumping out of an airplane. So he laughs and the guy beside him laughs, but it's a nervous laugh. And I know this guy doesn't like jumping, but he's qualified and does it because he's part of the unit. That's fear management. And I looked at, I looked at the guy who asked me and I said, do you have any fear skydiving? He goes, no, I love it. I've got like 600 plus jumps. I go whenever I can. And I said to him, no, no fear. He goes, nope. I said, then let me pack your shoot for you today. And he looks at me and he goes, I can't say it now because we'll have to beep it out. But he goes, you're not coming anywhere near my shoot. And I said, seriously, did I introduce any element of fear by suggesting someone else would tamper with your pre-jump ritual. And he goes, that's how subtle this is. A lot of people think fear is like, ah, uh, like that's not the fear. The fear could just be your butt just got tighter and you just realize you're vertically breathing. Yeah. And you go, like how many of you go, okay, box breathe, combat breath. Okay, get focused. And my favorite operators are the ones, and I remember uh, being on Mike Ritland's show and we're talking deep on fear. And Mike says, man, he says, every time I was stacked outside a building, I knew every male inside there was going to try and kill me. And if you didn't admit that you were afraid, but you were trained, you knew what you had to do. And you just, and, it, and so it, it, it needs to be thought of as more of performance anxiety because you are trained. You're about to go do something and it's okay to take a deep breath and make sure you, you've got this done. And everyone's different. Mike Tyson used to throw up before his fights. A lot of people don't know that. What is that? That is your body's physiological response at an extreme level to fear. Sure. And, and it, everybody has a way of handling it. And for some people, it's just uh, it's, it's saying that it doesn't exist. But you're doing something there, too. <clears throat> so along the way, Tim, I know that, uh, that Tony's had a big impact on your life. And you've, done, you've, you've followed him a long time. Who's been some of the bigger uh, influences on your training career and some of your best coaches or best trainers along the way? Uh, one of the biggest influencers was my former chief, Stan Standridge. And it was just kind of a general uh, way that he instructed because he personalized his instruction to his audience. And so it means much more to the audience when they're engaged and, and you personalize something that makes them uh, like put themselves in that place 
where then they are open and available to listen and learn. That's a big one. And Stan, Stan's a, like he's a, one of those stellar leaders that he comes along, you know, very, very rarely somebody like Stan comes along, but he's always stood by and he's been willing to do everything himself. He's been willing to take that first step himself. And I think that's his best way of leading. He's, he's just one of those guys that stands out. He's one of our instructors and he's a big influence, I think, on all of our lives along the way. So, yeah, big shout out to Stan, who's now the chief down in San Marcos. Right. Great dude. And we have him around the corner from us. Um, so, Tony. On your personal Mount Rushmore, hmm. who do you put? Who do you put on those on those four faces? It's, this is this is going to be crazy, but I think it's going to resonate with a lot of people. Uh, you know, Bruce Lee, yeah, right. Uh, Stallone as Rocky. All right. You know uh, the um, Sugar Ray Leonard. No. And I mean, there's there's a bunch of uh, uh, books and uh, but there's only three people right now on on my uh, Robert Conrad, the original. Right. And this is crazy, like weird, weird. If you read, I've done posts about e each of these people and how they truly influenced and impacted me as a young kid. Like when I was in the 60s, watching Bruce Lee as Cato in the Green Hornet and watching uh, uh, Robert Conrad as, as, you know, James West in the wild, wild West. It'd be crazy. You think, okay, Tony, how about Gandhi? How about, you know, and of, like Alan Watts, you know, uh, uh, like great thinkers. I, I read that stuff. They influenced me. Marcus Aurelius, like, but I'm not going to go. I personally, I can remember being, uh, sitting in front of the TV, the house could have been on fire. Jim West is fighting some guys and my mom's screaming, you better get up for dinner now or you're, what, mom? I'm like, I'm, I was riveted by anybody who could protect themselves and do the right thing and save the day. And and remember I said earlier with my, my skiing and other stuff, I always failed to reach what I believed was my, my ego's potential. Like, you deserve to be, like, why can't you win? Because of fear. So... You know, watching Stallone and Rocky, uh, uh, and then watching Sugar Ray Leonard do things Bruce Lee would write about in the ring, and all of these, and this is the most amazing things. Uh, Stallone, I, I ended up meeting and working on the set of Rocky Five because I was helping uh, train Tommy Morrison. And I remember going to, uh, this is a this sidebar story, uh, in Philly, we were, we went to one of the hockey uh, hockey games, and we left in Stallone's limo. At the end, it's Stallone, Jennifer Flavin, me, Tommy, and we're now that everyone knows that he's there because we snuck in underneath. We're coming out. The limo's mobbed. It's going like a mile an hour. There's women flashing. They're like, and he's got the window down this much, and he's like very humbly amazed. He's just he's going. He goes, I go, it's, it's, it's crazy, right? He goes, this is unbelievable. And I said, well, you've created these iconic characters. I mean, if the earth is going to blow up and somebody said, let's send out like something into space about iconic, I mean, Rambo, Rocky. I mean, that's, this is, you know, the, you're, those characters are heroes to people. Yeah. And he's staring, he doesn't even look at me, he's staring out. And he looks up at the sky through the crack in the window and he says under his breath, I was just trying to eke out a living. Crazy, right? I got goosebumps just thinking about that. But I got to, I got to spend time with Sugar Ray Leonard, Robert Conrad, and Stallone, and then became very good friends with Bruce Lee's son. So like the, the four people that shaped who I was up into the time I was like 20 years old from six years old somehow the universe said you're going to have like a deeper relationship with these people, which blows my mind. Hey, so, oh, so you grew up watching Robert Conrad and, and best of the West. So who's, uh, who's Tony Blower's Artemis Gordon? <laughs> wow. Uh, my Artie Gordon, uh, Gordon. I don't, I don't know. That's a great question. He was the, the, I've got a bunch of people that helped me not trip. You know, and I think it's a, a revolving thing. Tim will be that, you know, this this weekend at points. I think I've got a, a bunch of people who 
kind of like <clears throat> make sure I don't, I don't, cause I'm, I'm in e this eccentric, like I was, I was telling uh, Tim, I said, you know, this online course that I'm teaching, I love doing that because now I can go down these rabbit holes and, and he makes the joke going, Oh really? Like, no, you, surely not. You, you go down a rabbit because I go never, it's never stopped you. <laughs> my, my, my middle name is Tangent, right? And I somehow I managed to bring it back and, and uh, close the circle. But uh, there's a lot of people that, that help me get through the day and the week uh, over the over the years. And there's uh, like a ton of people I couldn't even name. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people that have not been through your training or haven't been around through your classes, uh, Tony offers these great classes around the country, around the world, and he leaves behind a big footprint. So there's always going to be a Artemis Gordon there for you. And for here, it's going to be Tim Pipes. And that's pretty damn, that's pretty good damn product to, to produce because you, you, you turned him into one of these things that he is now. But you leave a lot of those guys around the world and they all step in and help you out. And that's kind of a cool thing. Tim, I'm going to ask you this question and you're going to have to answer it for Tony. Hollywood calls tomorrow. We're making a, a movie about Tony's life. Who plays Tony? Oh man, that would be a hard one. I thought you'd be taller. <laughs> <laughs> we were joking about the the visual aspects and comparisons here, and, and you'd have to come up with someone that would that would match the image. So they probably would be taller and muscular. Tony. They probably would be, be <laughs> Thank you, you know, like Vin, uh, Vin Diesel, you know, somebody awesome like that. Probably. Somebody huge. Vin Diesel. I like that. That'd be a good one. Man, he'd be great. Big bald Tony. Wow. <laughs> That'd be a good one. That's Man. a crazy question. Yeah. You know what? I, I hit somebody with that uh, a couple of episodes ago we were recording and he didn't answer his answer. He said, my wife would tell you, he said, my wife would tell you Tom Hanks. It's like, wow, so you already knew the answer to that one. And that was pretty cool. So if, huh. if you think about that, that's when I, I ask a lot of people, Casey gets subjected to my weird questions throughout the week. And um, I ask these guys, it's like, oh, there's an uh, autobiography written about you, or there's a movie made about you. Who plays you in, who plays you in the movie? Yeah. I'd, I'd like to ask a question to, yeah. to Tim based on something you said, because I, 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 I've taught all of the, now I've got a, like a mobile training team. I've got like, you know, 11 people that I trust to teach all over the world. Uh, and um, it's uh, slightly bigger than that. But these are the ones where I go like, uh, like I don't even have to be there. I know the course is going to be great. And you said something that is making me think is like going somewhere and making an impression that people want to carry this on and and teach it to the to the best of their ability. So my question for Tim is, what is it you saw in the system? Because at a, at a superficial level, when somebody sees fingers splayed outside 90, they go, well, we do that in Penjack Salat. We do that in Aikido. We do that in karate. We do that. Everyone goes, we do a block. It's a rising block. What's the big deal? Uh, and then there's some people that go like, like, no, like it's not this physical thing. So the question is, you are a lifelong martial artist, combatives guy, exposed to all this stuff. When you saw the system, what is it that you saw that you went, okay, I got to be involved? Well, it was the stuff that like we've, we figured out that people normally don't talk about. You know, it's, it's, it is the mindset aspects, right? So, you know, and, you know, we, we, you know, as SWAT operators or, or SWAT guys, um, they're very cavalier and they'll, they'll say, you know, we're, we're going in and uh, we have no fear, but, but like we already talked about, you know, I used your, your parachute example recently when I had an hour block to teach our cadets at Abilene about fear management and just to express that we all have our fears and, and guys, before we ever did anything physical, we talked about, you know, we talk about in, in, uh, in the police academy, we talk about stress and and health and through in that that fear management block to talk about mindset. Like we all have these fears and and it may be different for different people. You know, my fear, um, I, I went back to when I became a cancer patient when I, you know, very early in my law yeah. enforcement career, right? Nobody wants to hear that. And that scares, scared me to death. Yeah. And then I talked about how my first wife left me. I was abandoned. I was lonely. And I, that scared me to death. And so it's different for different people. But as, as we teach our new cadets and our new police officers, we have to know that they are capable of dealing with those things in their head first and foremost before they ever get to the physical stuff. Because if they can't think critically, they're never going to perform physically. 
And so that was the that was like the missing piece that, that starts to change everything about how now I try to impart things that Tony has has taught me that he's been teaching for years and years as I move forward in my defensive tactics, my firearms, any of those things that I teach now. Yeah, and, and that's the that, that's the thing that comes back because I think all forms. All forms of martial arts, all forms of combatives work if you get attacked the right way, right? So, yeah, and, but, our, but our control tactics don't work in those out of control situations, right? Yeah, exactly. So and then and what do you thing. do when you get surprised? And and so, it's and, just, you, it's and you revert, piece. you revert back to that to, to the mental capacity that you built up. It's not about how many strikes you can do or how many miles you can run. If you have the mental capacity to actually perform when things aren't coming at you the way you wanted them to come at you. So how, what kind of impact have you seen in your guys' training systems or just overall uh, mindset training with the guys back home when, you, when they have that critical incident, when we have shootings on, on duty or there's something, something even bigger like, a, like a, a divorce or a death in the family? What kind of impact have you seen that have on the guys back home, the, or the officers on the streets, the guys and girls who are out there serving how does that help them or how does that change them on the resiliency side or mental health well, side? Well, now it gives them an explanation for what is happening yeah. that we used to just ignore or stuff away, right? Now we understand that, you know, I've been involved in officer-involved shootings and I understand why I flinched when that gunfire went off in my direction or um, how they now deal with it. And that gives us permission to, to involve the emotional aspects and the, the reasons why. So now we can process that and move forward and deal with the emotions and all of those things that, that are part of it instead of just compact that away somewhere and then it becomes toxic. I'd like to inject something here. You know, you remember the, the No Fear Company? Oh, yeah. The adrenaline Company. So I used to, as a joke, I'd wear that in certain presentations. I'd say, like, I've had fear my whole life, right? And the number one fear is public speaking. I'm up here public speaking. I don't have a fear of public speaking, but I've got other fears. And I said, but I think these shirts are defective then because like I bought all their models and I still have fear, but it says no fear on my shirt and everyone, you know, jokes. And now what we did was we created a company called No Fear and it's spelled K-N-O-W. And the idea is that when you change your relationship with fear, when you get to actually know what fear is there for, it can be used as a fuel or something cathartic, right? It's outside your comfort zone and, and you're, but preloading people in advance. It's like you can figure out how to clear a malfunction or you can be taught what causes malfunction, how to clear the malfunction, do an armorer's course, understand, and you demystify the whole system. And that is going to enhance, like when something happens, you're not freaking out. You're now solving the problem because you understand it. So people get through stuff and the universe gives us lessons and blah, 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 and it's all valid. But this, this idea of telling somebody, is like, like Tim said, you know, the stuff wasn't addressed, but I do something in our, in our program. And the, the, the actual schematic is called the cycle of behavior. And it just talks about this fear loop that doubt creates hesitation. Hesitation creates procrastination, procrastination unchecked becomes fixation. That uh, like formula or that, that algorithm happens in a nano moment. It's the difference between drawing your gun and not drawing your gun. You know, we live in a crazy time right now, right? Where the distraction isn't just, is this a shoot, no shoot, black and white? It's like, who's filming this? What's the current political trend? And these things are are uh, poisoning officers' minds through osmosis. They're not even not even aware of it, right? This morning I was just scrolling my uh, one of my feeds and it was just over and over again, negative, negative. And I felt my body getting in a bad mood. And it's self-awareness, only self-awareness that makes you stop scrolling and go, what are you doing? You got you to close this stuff and, and get off social media right now. So teaching people in advance what happens when there's a fear spike, because in, in the law enforcement, tactical, military, first responder, public safety community, there's that, like I said, when I first started, there's this, now we're different and this is this is just the way it is but everyone in uniform is a human being right and so understanding how your mind works like understanding how a gun works you, you i always said i've always said if you do an armor's course you become a better shooter even if you're not on the range because you now have demystified this operating system most people don't understand the difference between the psychology of fear and the physiology or biology of fear and the ability to say, I'm scared right now, what do I need to do? 
And in some cases, if I have time, it's what do I need to learn. And in some cases, things are happening so quickly, it's okay, what do I need to do? This is a choiceless choice. I either cooperate with this attacker or I don't, right? And it's very, very subtle. Uh, we've got now a, a psychologist who specializes in uh, uh, treating PTSD, who's using our whole fear management protocol in his practice and has been for a few years. I didn't even know this because he came to one of our courses as a high level Krav Maga expert. I didn't know his, his career for 20 years was, you know, psychology and therapy. And he said to me one day, he said, this is maybe more effective than anything I've learned in 20 years. Cause I don't get around with, I don't dance around. I go, you're in the fear loop. You need to get out of the fear loop. And it's like just giving you a strip map. You're lost. You're right here. This is where you need to go. This is right. daylight here. Something they can visualize and actually learn from and progress through. That's pretty good. And we have to do that. We have to constantly teach that. So you talked about your online course and how I'd like to hear a little bit about how that evolved because we're going through the COVID, the COVID year, the COVID era. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff that wasn't planned out and a lot of people didn't have that in place, man. So how did you come up with that? That was, that was a, 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 a that was a scary 24 hours. All of my, so we've got uh, several verticals in my company. One is the high gear equipment. And the, the other stuff is all in-person training, law enforcement, military, general public. So two weeks, I was actually, you know, when President Trump closed the borders, I was actually in uh, London, just wrapping up uh, one of our biggest classes ever waking up to texts going, hey, like, and that was crazy because I didn't know if I was going to get back. Because in the moment, you don't go, well, I'm a U.S. citizen now. I got a passport. Of course, I can. But in the moment, you're like, am I going to be trapped here? And I'm just thinking about zombie apocalypse stuff. And there's only one airport open in Europe, and it's Heathrow. And you got two days. to. And my brain, and this is a crazy thing that I tell people, when you get a fear spike, it's a stimulus that gets introduced too quickly. And this connects to the physiology, depending on what's happening, this either creates a movie in your mind where you're the producer, the director, the screenwriter, and you've cast yourself as victim number one. You know, when you say, I got this news and I got scared, that's the movie you start playing. And you could do that in a physical fight, you can do that in emotional, psychological. But also when a stimulus is introduced too, too quickly, if it's a physical, it's a start of flinch. Right. And just uh, to uh, um, reel me back in a minute, but I want to, for, for our, our law enforcement out there, if you go into a shoot house now, training shoot house, where are most of the missed marking cartridge rounds? They're all above the door yep. in the corner. So I make this joke when I'm working with firearms instructors and I'm teaching them the spear system, which is when you start a flinch, your hands... First of all, your executive function bypasses uh, your cognitive skills, and now your survival system comes in. At that level, Eddie, if I whip this bottle at you, you wouldn't grab it out of the air. Your hand, if I surprised you, right. your, hand, your hands Protection. would come. So if you were holding a gun at me and you hadn't decided to shoot me because you were using that weapon as part of the command process, drop it, drop it, whatever, and I did something... If I make you flinch, your hand defaults to protect. And so when people are spending millions of dollars doing forensic studies on famous shootouts, I go, start a flinch for free, right? How do, how do you know, if you jerk the trigger from 10 feet away, you missed your target. From five feet away, maybe that headshot hits a shoulder. But if you go back to the marking cartridge, all of the, I always make this joke, are your role players like giraffes? How are how are the, these shots up there? It's because when the defender got surprised, they start a flinch, jerk the trigger, and the, and the, the, round, the round went high. So um, reel me back to the original question. So what I was looking for is a little bit about how, we, uh, how you started out with the uh, online university. Right. You know. Okay. So <laughs> I went down this, this crazy uh, uh, tangent because I want people to understand that even though I've done decades of research on fear management, use sure. all of the world, uh, this is the, my message that's throughout the whole podcast is underneath our uniform and our hat, we're a human being. And so here I was going, oh, I'm spending time with the family. This is cool. I'm chilling out. I'm working out more. My wife's cooking. I said to her, I didn't know you know how to cook. We always eat out. She goes, well, now that the restaurants are closed, I have to cook. 
I go, but you're a good cook. She said, I was always a good cook. I just like eating out. I was like, oh my God, like, <laughs> wow, all that money. So the, um, uh, <laughs> like that's it. not where your money went. <laughs> right. Right. But the, uh, uh, part of it did, but anyhow, the, the, I'm sitting there one day and all of a sudden I get a call from a police agency. Hey, we got to cancel. We got to postpone. We got to cancel. I, with the, two weeks flat in the curve, I had 15 courses get canceled. As a small business, that's not sustainable. All high gear sort of stopped, right? Because like nobody was what? training, defund the police. And one day I'm sitting there, I went, if this continues, and I looked up and I see my, my kids walk by in the living room and they're laughing, playing with the dogs. I said, I will not be able to feed my family. I will lose my business. I will lose my house. And I got... It was like somebody stuck a vacuum up my butt and started to suck out my insides. I like, I was like, oh my God. You got sucker punched. Oh, it was like, yeah. And uh, for 24 hours, I was just scared to death. I didn't know what I was going to do. And uh, two things happened. I was talking to uh, a buddy of mine named Steve Weatherford, who's a pretty, pretty big guy, uh, yeah, NFL. Uh, retired NFL, big in the fitness space. We we're talking, and I said, uh, "Dude, do you have any?" Uh, he's a wicked entrepreneur. I said, "Dude, any any thoughts?" Because I just it was like somebody just closed my business. And he says to me on the phone, he says, "Hey, aren't you uh, like a famous self defense guy?" I said, "I said, yeah, I think so." He goes, "He says I've got 150 people who work out with me every day in Zo on Zoom." and watch me work out and they train with me. He says, why don't you do some sort of garage gym thing? And I sat up and I filmed the video and I wrote a letter and I sent it out to my audience and I had a hundred people sign up that week. Awesome. That saved my business. Uh, two other things I did is I, I, I mean that, that seeing a solution and everyone listening, seeing a solution suddenly makes you go from I'm, I'm exaggerating the start of flinch because I wasn't like, like this. It was like more deer in the headlights. And as soon as I had a solution, the creative part of the brain started kicking your posture changes. And I called the team together. I said, guys, we've got to pivot to digital as fast as possible. I, and I, I said, I need a course online. I need some ideas for this. And I got the MTT together. And, and we had ideas a week later. Within two months, I had four new websites. We were teaching online. Awesome. Um, and um, uh, the serendipitous element here is in 1993, when I closed my school to focus on law enforcement and public safety, all I had wanted to do when I was a teenager was be a martial artist and teach people self-defense. And when I closed my school, it was the hardest thing I ever did, but it was the best thing I ever did because it made us all meet. And, right. and I really feel like when I was 20, I was asked, what do you want to do? And I said to this, this guy, I said, I want to make the world safer. And he said, how are you going to do that? Isn't that a little grandiose? And I was like, I don't know. And that's all I do since, since then, since 1980 is try to make the world safer. But going out, I remember at, at SWAT Roundup with my son, he's seven years old, Nikki says to me, uh, dad, I want to be, I want to be a, uh, uh, a cop one day. I said, you can be whatever you want. And, uh, I said, that's cool. Uh, and he asked me, how come I'm not a cop? I said, well, it just, it didn't work out that way. But I said, I teach them. I, and he looks at me, he, he said, I said, why do you want to be a cop? He said, I want to arrest bad guys. I said, guess how many bad guys I helped arrest last year? And he goes, how, he says, none. Cause you're not a cop. I said, no, I helped arrest like thousands because all these guys here, I train them and I teach them how to do their better, their job with more confidence. Yeah. And uh, it was, it was kind of a, a, a neat thing, but the, the garage gym and we, we're at class uh, 200 this week, one year, five classes live a week. And what I was going to say, the serendipity of this is the first day of class, I say to my wife, wow, I have like so much anxiety. She goes, anxiety. I just like, why? I said, I like, cause I'm teaching. She goes, well, you're like the best spear instructor in the world. It's your system. What are you, what are you worried about? I said, I'm not worried about the, the movement. I'm, I haven't taught a group class since 1993. And what I mean by that is like, like 
like teaching a four day or five day seminar isn't a group class. It's a one off. Right. I don't know if I'm going to see you. I bump into you years later. Hey, you made an impression. Then you get a guy like Tim who goes, I want to be involved. But I travel over the world. I don't see 97% of the people that I trained ever again. We're in a group class. It's like a family. You get together, you see each other every week. And I was, I was actually kind of reflecting back to what it was like for 13 years running my martial arts school where I knew everyone's name. I knew what everyone's doing. And I was kicking that off again. And there's this weird energy about it. And it kind of like, it was like the fountain of youth for me. I've been, I've been having, like, it's totally resurrected my teaching energy. So that was weird serendipity on top of it saving yeah, the business. Yeah, and, and that's a huge thing. Is it, whatever it takes to keep reviving the way you think about it, and you said the word confidence, and I think that's like the dope of choice for most of us that, that operate at different levels. Everybody operates at a different level. Um, but I think that for, for me, I just see that as the dope of choice because that's why they're going to go to a different team or they're going to go to a different training or they're going to try a new weapon or, or whatever it is, a new challenge. Just you have to build confidence in different ways, and I, I see that a, a lot. So the onset of or the, the big proliferation of um, the BJJ out there, how has that impacted your all's training? Did you all mix that into the, to the training of what you all do in, in Abilene? Yes. Or how did you all put that in? How, who's, whose influence did you all have? Um, Gracie is the big influence, I think, worldwide probably. But um, how many times have you said that – Spear is the gateway to your next move, right? Because you're never going to do your your double leg takedown. You're never going to do your fancy fill in the blank martial arts style if you don't survive the ambush, right? So if you don't have that piece to plug in, then you're still missing a piece of that puzzle. Yeah, has that impacted the training? So before COVID, did you see an impact on your on your class attendance or or people calling you for training? Or is that just another space in, in the training world where BJJ just exists on, the, on your side or on the side of you? You know, there's, there's a couple of ways to look at it. First of all, um, uh, you know, unless you're at the beach tanning, there's a good chance that your fight is starting standing. Right? Right. And so there's no time I ever want to be on a concrete with one or multiple assailants. And so the big paradigm, and I've been saying this since 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 day one, that uh, you know you don't want to be on the ground. But I also say, and a lot of people think I'm knocking BJJ. I love jujitsu. It's chest with muscles at 100 miles an hour. You know, it's it's uh, uh, grappling with somebody who understands grappling is a, one of the scariest things you can do. Having you know started in wrestling, didn't realize that that was an important you know, part of the whole mixed martial art complexity. But I tell people, everyone, because because people like to go and, you know, create the division. Oh, so you're anti-jiu-jitsu, you're anti-this. You're anti I go, no, listen, it's a skill set that you need to have, but you shouldn't predispose yourself to try and solve everything by taking someone to the ground. Because there's a lot of scenarios where being on your feet is way more important and strategic. Listen, there's, I'm trying to think of, I want to share this story. So two things. One, everyone I talk to, and we have a ground fighting program, but it's the, we're not teaching people to control people on the ground. We're teaching people how to fight on the ground, how to get to your weapon, how to get somebody off you, how to get back to your feet. And so the the most important elements of of the spear system research is whether the ambush emotionally psychologically and then physically using primal gross motor movement creates space and so we we tell people logically and this is just neuroscience you go from primal gross motor to gross motor to complex motor skill i believe that one of the biggest mistakes defensive tactics makes is showing people complex motor skill solutions for every type of attack your complex motor skill you'd only access that when you're cool, calm, and collected. And so if you've got a sudden violent encounter, your body's gross motor system starts to kick in. It's, it's why you shoot center mass instead of left eyeball in a high stress situation. Right. Uh, so going back to the BJJ thing, as I would tell the hardest person to take to the ground is somebody who's not afraid to the ground. So every cop 
should bring in Gracie or work with somebody that's teaching you because it changes your balance and your control. Then when you take something to the ground, you're focusing on, you shouldn't be focused on grappling them. You should be focusing them on handcuffing them. But it's differentiating between, I, I call it, break this down in a confrontation where we're at, at inside the reactionary gap. If the bad guy moves first, my, res my responses need to be protective. If I decide to move first because I see pre-contact indicators, that's preemptive. But people don't break down, or like our stuff is in insanely scientific and, and, and steeped in true neuroscience and understanding the myelinization of the neuron. And when you, and this is the biggest thing here, when you train almost exclusively a certain way, you myelinate the neuron to move a certain way. And people confuse that as muscle memory. There's literally no muscle memory, right? If you're, you know, if, 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 if Tim has a gun and he's got great muscle memory, if I run up to him before he draws his weapon with a katana and cut his arm off and it falls to the ground, it's not going to try to, you know, grab his pistol. It's just going to be lying there. And I use this graphic metaphor as if you're disconnected from the problem, you can't access this skill. So it's a neural pattern that makes you grab your gun combined with what I call it, the three eyes, instincts, intuition, and intelligence. I got to have the training. I got to have the neural pa uh, pattern, but somebody who's untrained isn't going to grab their weapon. The big thing here, and, and I, you know, I, you guys know, I don't like to go off on tangents or down rabbit holes. No, not at all. Not ever. And, and the big thing here is this, your unconscious bias, the neural pattern of the way you like to solve a problem affects your true real-time situational awareness. Right. So if you're a Taekwondo expert and you and I start to get into a confrontation, uh, there's a non-conscious part of your brain that's looking for the round kick, the back kick, the front kick. If you're a jiu-jitsu expert and, and I'm in your face, there's a part of you that goes, he makes a move, I'm double-legging this guy and taking him to the, like you're going to your go-to move. If you just know OC, you're thinking, okay, when should I spray the person? When? And we deep, people don't understand this is neuroscience. We need to, in, in, the, in the era we're in, it's always been, the statement's always been true, but in the optics on law enforcement now, and we the whole de-escalation, we need to go, what is the safest thing that I can do right now to handle this confrontation? And I need clarity and situational awareness. So long answer, went off on a tangent, but that's what you get. Sorry. Hey man, we're uh, it's the Tony Blower show sometimes, and we know we know how to handle it. It's, it's, we we appreciate Just it because sit back, you're pre get a drink. Yeah, exactly. And we we enjoy the all the, all the information. All the candidates are good. Casey, I'm going to turn it over to them here in a second for some closing thoughts. But do you have any questions you want to ask them? You know, I don't appreciate the time. I think uh, I mean the purpose of life is to uh, live, love, learn, and leave a legacy. And uh, I appreciate all the insight that you've given, definitely us and and even me. Just sitting back, hitting a couple of buttons, I was going. Man, I wouldn't have asked that, but I sure am glad he did. And man, nice rabbit holes. I mean, very thank impressive. You, thank, thank you. Yeah, it's it's all it's always enlightening getting guys like you guys. Y'all are masters of your craft, and and it's it's constantly evolving thing. We had a doctor on earlier who we talk about. It's like you never stop learning. We always we always evolve, and and we always keep learning. Um, give us some closing thoughts, Tim. Oh man. I was thinking about something while you were talking, and I've already already forgotten about it. Well, I'm glad this must you're, be a, a getting old thing. Yeah, it probably is because I did that four times today. <laughs> well, see, you're still having you still have a good influence then. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I got nothing for you. So, all right, no worries. No worries. Tony? Come on, Tony. What you got for closing? Uh, the most important thing that I can share with you is this thought, and it's out of our No Fear program. The people who manage their fear manage to fight the people who manage their fear manage to fight the operative word there is to fight it doesn't ensure victory but it ensures that you're in the fight and and the fear we need to manage is is self-doubt and it could be anything in your life from a gunfight to a fist fight to your marriage to business to i'm retiring what am i going to do and now we're suddenly left with this movie in our mind 
and we we need to and i use this metaphor a lot i shared it earlier it's this this fear factory in our in our in our mind where we start to run this movie we're director we're producer we're screenwriter we're casting director and we're now casting ourselves as a victim as opposed to you know the the hero in your story and what does what does what does action tim do what does action eddie do what does action casey do here and you remember in the beginning of every movie the action starred gets kidnapped gets beaten up and then comes back so i, I don't want to make this too goofy but but it's literally that there's a moment where like with the pandemic where for 24 hours i'm like visualizing the end of the world and i'm never going to be out of it and then it's like suddenly you got to turn into macgyver how am i getting out of this elevator and and it all if i can in, in influence uh everybody st studying fear and learning how to manage your fear improves your self-awareness and that improves your critical thinking and that's how you that's how you get out of the fear loop all right i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you a cop question okay so i want the truth on this one did you ever duke boys slide across the top of your patrol car <laughs> <laughs> i visualized that many times but never did no awesome. growing up uh watching that uh, it was definitely uh, a thought a few times though, but I remembered something else I wanted to, to close with. Maybe if I had a, a moment to say a closing statement, because you were talking about um, confidence right. and I've, I've been kind of using this language um, recently about instilling confidence in people. And I'm, I'm very, I believe very deeply that the confidence that is built and established with personal defense readiness really sets the stage for people to step out radically in service. Right. So if you're confident in your in your well-being and your health and your fitness and your ability to protect yourself and the people you love, that's going to have an effect on how you step out with confidence to serve others. And I really think that, you know, the, the kind of circles that we run in, that's kind of the mindset of, uh, of our kind and our the warrior craft. So uh, I, I just wanted to touch on that as a kind of a closing thing for me that came to mind. Yeah, that, that, that sounds awesome. I think that's a great way to close it, Casey. Do me a favor, visit us at alert.org. That's A-L-E-R-R-T dot org for questions, comments, or concerns about the podcast. We are at the call at alert.org. And with that, we are out. Fade to black. <laughs>